Good evening. Welcome. I'm Sean Murphy. I'm the president of the American Society of International Law, and I'm really delighted to welcome all of you here uh, tonight. For those of you who are not particularly familiar with the American Society of International Law, we were founded in 1906, and uh, we were founded for the purpose of engaging in a scholarly inquiry uh, into the field of international law and feel that we've become the preeminent society of international law in uh, the field. So for more than a century, we've uh, hosted a variety of events um, of one kind or another, sometimes public, sometimes private. Uh, we've sought to basically study uh, international law for the purpose of understanding it, uh, promoting it, uh, explaining to those that don't follow it what it's all about. Uh, all for the purpose of uh, uh, bringing about a just and peaceful world. Um, you're sitting here in the society's headquarters. We refer to it as Tiller House. It was bequeathed in 1959 to the society by Genevieve Tiller, uh, who along with her husband, who uh, predeceased her, were uh, very interested in the rule of law and international affairs. Uh, you will have noticed we're located here on Embassy Row. Uh, you might have heard a lot of sirens about 20 minutes ago. Uh, that was probably the vice president going home from the White House uh, to his perch up near the Naval Observatory. Uh, in any event, we're very uh, pleased with our location amidst the diplomatic corps uh, here in Washington, D.C. Taylor House uh, is the home for, uh, or I should say houses, uh, our 15 spectacular staff uh, who do all the work relating to the society. Uh, and it is also the venue where we host dozens of events every year. Uh, if you're in town next Tuesday, uh, we're having our holiday party, so please feel free to stop by for that. Uh, tonight, we're really delighted to be hosting the eighth uh, Shaptai Rosen Memorial Lecture. Uh, it's a lecture series that commemorates the contributions of Shaptai Rosen uh, to the fields of law and diplomacy. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for the American Society of International Law to partner uh, with one of our platinum publishing partners, uh, Brill Nyhoff. Uh, also delighted that we can partner with uh, Alan Stevens, uh, Shaptai Rosen's literary executor, who's here, and also with the Rosen uh, family. And representing uh, the family here tonight, we have uh, Shaptai's son, uh, Daniel as well as his life, uh, Zippy, and we're delighted to have you here uh, with us as well. Uh, I'm also very happy that tonight's speaker is the Society's honorary president, uh, Professor Michael Reisman, uh, and also uh, to acknowledge uh, his wife, Manush Arsanjani, who's here. She herself is a distinguished uh, international lawyer and longtime member and patron of the Society. Uh, I won't attempt to recognize all the other esteemed individuals here uh, this evening, but I do want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Professor Bertrand Ramcharan uh, because he delivered the third uh, Rosen Memorial Lecture in 2013, so we're really pleased to have you here. Uh, ASIL, the American Society, counted Shaptai Rosen as one of its most celebrated members, indeed in 1999. ASIL awarded Shaptai our highest honor, which is the Manly O. Hudson Medal, which is awarded each year to a distinguished person for outstanding contributions to scholarship and achievement in the field of international law. And if I may, on a personal note, I would like to uh, say that I counted Shaptai as a very good friend of mine and mentor. I met him for the first time in the late 1980s in The Hague uh, as a part of the team of the U.S. Department of State that was arguing a case called the Elsie case against Italy. Uh, Shaptai was an advisor to the U.S. delegation, and the reason he was an advisor is that if you wanted to know anything about the International Court of Justice, Shaptai was the person to go to, whether it was procedural questions or questions about the court's jurisprudence, uh, he was the person to talk to. And on that delegation, uh, Shaptai made the point of taking me out to dinner one night, talking with me about my background and my hopes as a young lawyer at the Department of State, 
and always let it be known that any time I wanted to come to talk to him or reach out to him about uh, next steps uh, as I made my path forward, he was available. And so I'm delighted that we're able to, to be here tonight in honor of him. Uh, when the fourth edition of Shaptai's uh, monumental and impressive work on the law and practice of the International Court was published in 2006, I jumped at the opportunity to review it in the American Journal of International Law, which is the flagship journal of our society. It appears in volume 100, uh, and it's not as impressive as the treatise itself, but it was a joy to, to do the review. I would note that the fifth edition came out in 2016 under the editorship of Malcolm Shaw. And if you're wondering who the publisher was, it's none other than one of the most preeminent publishers in the field of international law, Brill Nyhoff. Uh, so again, it's an honor to partner with Brill in this evening for this lecture, and it's my great pleasure to invite to the podium Peter Koberg, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Brill Nyhoff. Peter. Uh, dear guests, uh, Daniel, Zippy, Rosen, Professor Riesman, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's an honor for Brill to once again co-host the prestigious Rosen Lecture. As Sean said, uh, this is the eighth lecture we are organizing, um, and the second one here in the US. Uh, the first being at the United Nations headquarters in New York in 2015. Brill is proud to be the publisher of many of the most important works by one of the most renowned and influential international law scholars. Rosen's Law and Practice of the International Court, now in its fifth edition, is considered to be the leading treatise on the world court and one of the flagship products within Brill Nayoff's portfolio. A new edition of Rosen's World Court book is in progress with publication expected next year. As the biography in the program booklet outlines, Shabtai Rosen, as a scholar and diplomat, with an unrivaled knowledge of the law, focused on global challenges and was always conscious of practical problems. This combination of theory and practice also underlies um, Brill's new mission statement, a key, element, a key element of which is the firm belief that scholarship in the humanities, social sciences, and international law is vital for addressing contemporary challenges. With the challenges the world is facing today, academic work in these domains is more relevant than ever to help understand what it really means to lead a good life and to address issues like globalization, the rise and fall of societies, migration, the functioning of democracies, the history of conflicts, inequality or climate change, to name just a few. Many of us have witnessed trends in government and university funding toward toward science and technology, with reductions in support for the humanities and social sciences and in an international law. At the core of our mission is the belief that it is crucial for society to continue investing in research in the humanities, social sciences and international law, vital pillars of academia and, and society. Brill stands also alongside our authors and customers to convey this message to governments, university bodies, and funding agencies. Through social media and many on and offline events, such as this evening's, we raise our voices to promote the important work being done in the humanities. Brill has also teamed up with Twitter, with the Twitter hashtag Humanities Matter, which is being used globally by many organizations and individuals 
to continue to increase awareness of the critical role the study of humanities plays. Consistent with Brill's mission statement is the role of corporate social responsibility. Specific to the realm of international law, Brill is proud to be the founding partner of GOLI, which stands for Global Online Access to Legal Information, and it is part of the Research for Life uh, program of the United Nations. This program enables students and researchers in developing countries to have free or very low cost access to a vast collection of books and other content from a broad range of publishers. I would like to, li I would like to thank Alan Stevens, Professor Rosen's literary executor, my colleague Marie Sheldon, president of Brill USA, and the staff at the American Society of International Law for organizing this event. And of course, I would like to thank Professor Michael Riesman very much for delivering tonight's Shabtai Rosen Memorial Lecture, to which I look forward. I wish you all a very informative evening. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Alan Stevens. I've been mentioned a couple of times, so you know who I am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, officers and members of the American Society of International Law. Once again, it's my privilege to speak on behalf of the Roseanne family, and in particular on behalf of uh, Daniel and Sippy, who have traveled from Israel to be with us uh, for the eighth time um, in, uh, at the lecture in honor of their father and father-in-law. I'm delighted to welcome you all in that capacity and to introduce this evening's distinguished lecturer, Professor Michael Reisman. I attended many occasions like today's with Shabtai and quickly became aware that he had little time for plaudits or eulogies. However, on an evening like this, we can't deprive ourselves of the pleasure of reflecting upon his immense contribution to the study and development of international law. Sean Murphy and Peter Kuberg have already shared some illuminating thoughts from their particular perspectives, and their words add to the recognition which Shabtai received during his lifetime from his most distinguished peers. Membership of the Institut de Droit International, the first Hague Prize for International Law, and of course the Manly O. Hudson Medal of this wonderful American Society of International Law. Shabtai greatly cherished that medal because of the special respect and affection which he had for the society and for the American legal scholarship in general. With that in mind, we can be sure that he would have warmly welcomed the volume of Brill Nyhoff's impressive and sometimes breathtaking series, American Classics in International Law, a series under the wise general editorship of none other than Michael Reisman. The beautiful tribute to Shabtai, penned by Professor Malcolm Shaw and reproduced in the booklet uh, distributed today, details many of Shabtai's achievements and the obituary which appeared in the Times of London in 2010 put him at the very peak of the international lawyers of his generation. Few would dispute that assessment. My own involvement with Shabtai and with his charming and witty wife Esther began when I became his publisher, and our friendship endured for nearly 30 years. The work of a publisher has much in common with that of an anthologist, and uh, Michel de Montaigne, in introducing one of his anthologies, wrote, I have gathered a posy of other men's flowers, and only the thread that binds them is my own. I know that I speak for many of my erstwhile colleagues when I say that in our bouquet of authors, Shabtai was among the very pick of the bunch. We admired him for his erudition, his integrity, and his energy. We respected him for his courtesy, his fairness, and his decency. And we loved him for his warmth, his generosity, and his loyalty. And now we move to another erudite and lovable gentleman. <clears throat> In keeping with Shabtai's approach, I won't read out a list of Michael Reisman's accomplishments, achievements, and appointments, 
A brief guide to them is contained in the booklet. And in any case, anyone who has had anything to do with international law over the last five or six decades will know all about Michael's immense contribution to the theory and practice of law. Shabtai was never a fully paid up member of the New Haven School of Jurisprudence or International Law. But he and I often discuss the fascinating work of Professors Laswell, MacDougall, and Reisman. And I also discuss Shabtai and his particularities with Professor MacDougall and with Michael. You can do that sort of thing when you're a publisher. Um, I won't try to pretend that I was able to discern underlying threads from which a fabric could be woven which connected the approaches to international law of Shabtai and Michael but they did have some very striking characteristics in common. Like the old grammarian celebrated in Robert Browning's marvelous poem, they shared a passion for precision and accuracy in language. This passion can sometimes lead to cramped thought processes, but with Shabtai and Michael, this was definitely not the case. As they combined, and Michael still happily combines, precision and accuracy with a remarkable ability to think and conceptualize in a brilliantly free-ranging and associative way, which is reminiscent of the great sages of the Talmud, a work with which, ni which neither of them was unfamiliar and to which Shabtai often turned for inspiration. Michael's topic this evening, parallel proceedings in international law, greatly interested Shabtai as he was always dedicated to the idea that international law and international legal proceedings should be practiced and conducted with the greatest possible efficiency and clarity. Michael, speaking for the Roseanne family and for all of us involved in organizing this event, I want to express our deep appreciation for your acceptance of our invitation to deliver this eighth Shabtai Roseanne Memorial Lecture. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alan, for that kind and very generous introduction. I should say that the conveners of this lecture series gently but firmly advised me when I was approached that it is a lecture that's contemplated and not 45 minutes of encomia for Shabtai Rosen. It was good that I was so advised because given the immense contribution of the person to whose memory this lecture series is dedicated, it would be natural and fruitful to spend an hour reviewing and praising the extraordinarily extensive, detailed, and insightful corpus of scholarship that Shabtai Rosen bequeathed the world community. The subject this evening is the multiplicity of parallel procedures in international law and the variety of responses to them. In the interest of transparency, I note at the outset that I was of counsel in the recent provisional measures phase of the still pending Gutter v. United Arab Emirates case in the ICJ. Although it raised questions, among others, concerning parallel procedures, my discussion this evening will not be a parallel procedure to that case. Rather, my interest is the phenomenon of par multiple parallel proceedings in international law in general, the reasons for their recurrence, the purposes benign and malign they serve, and in particular, why authoritative responses to them vary markedly from sector to sector. In brief, my thesis is that because of the archipelagic character of international law, lawmaking advances in fits and starts and piece by piece, and law applying is fragmented and not integrated. <clears throat> 
Responses to multiple parallel processes vary from island to island <clears throat> or sector to sector as a function of the degree to which that island or sector can provide meaningful remedies and the purposes which multiplicity in each serves. The more remedially effective the sector, one would expect the lower the tolerance for multiple parallel procedures. Sectors with a lower degree of remedial effectiveness may also include general prohibitions in their rules. But the actual prohibitions will vary from case to case as a function of a number of variables, including the importance and urgency of the values at stake to the relevant community. Thus, I will try to show that the apparent inconsistency and superficial legal untidiness of international law's response to the multiplicity of parallel procedures may actually be coherent in terms of the animating international policies, if not always in terms of the explicit rules. I propose to elaborate the thesis first <clears throat> and then examine the different practices in a few unrelated sectors of international law. The United Nations Charter and the United Nations, the human rights bodies, international investment law, and international commercial arbitration. The scope of multiple and parallel procedures can be defined narrowly and exclusively or broadly and inclusively. Many scholars, for many scholars, procedures are considered to be parallel if they are both judicial or at least judicial and arbitral. This is also the legal focus in municipal contexts. There, the focus is confined to parallel and contemporaneous ju judicial procedures, in some instances, parallel arbitral procedures, and in situations in which the New York or Panama Conventions are in force. In municipal law, whether its constitutive structure is federal or unitary, this narrow focus is appropriate because of a plethora of courts and tribunals of varying types endowed with compulsory jurisdiction and distributed horizontally and vertically. In that context, there are many occasions in which disputes may fulfill the jurisdictional and admissibility requisites of two or more fora. Because of variations in procedural and substantive law, some of these fora may seem more favorable to one of the litigants. That possibility can provoke a dash to different courthouses, sometimes even by the same litigant. Domestic principles of institutional economy and procedural justice are offended by substantially the same case being pursued simultaneously in two different but effective forums. Doctrines of lease alibi pendants and forum nonconvenience arrest the multiplication in limina litis and in a predictable and orderly way. International law's political structure differs in profound ways from domestic legal arrangements. To comprehend the phenomenon of parallel proceedings, there the focus of inquiry may have to be wider and more inclusive. For one thing, the degree of organization and effectiveness of international law varies more widely than it does in advanced domestic legal systems. Normatively, international law enforces its writ or asserts its writ and its general principles to the furthest reaches of the planetary and near space realms. But where its domain is, viewed in terms of the degree of organization and predictable remedial effectiveness, a different map emerges and international law takes on an archipelagic character 
in which islands of organized and effectively applied law operate alongside offshore zones in which the expected effectiveness is considerably lower, and in still others in which the law simply yields to unilateral political decision. Indeed, no less an authority than Hugo Grotius in his Law of War and Peace conceded that with respect to just war, the international law's ultimate ratio in his theory, I'm quoting Grotius, it can scarcely be known by external indications in a just war what is the proper limit of self-defense or recovery of property or of exaction of punishment so that it is by all means better to leave this to the conscience of the belligerents than to appeal to extraneous decision, end quote. That would certainly put this in one of the offshore zones that I've just described. In international law, the level of actual integration of various legal programs is low. Treaties nibble at only one part of a problem. Moreover, the processes of lawmaking and law application are neither unified nor even coordinated. Omnibus treaties, which undertake to prescribe for all the facets of a phenomenon and also to create mechanisms for interpreting and applying their law to disputes arising under them, the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention comes to mind, are very rare. Although often envisaged as part of a larger political, social, or environmental program, individual treaties tend to be narrower in scope treating only targets of opportunity, those aspects of a general problem on which political agreement can be reached at that point in time. Thus, an environmental treaty may address only that part of a current problem that is politically ripe for agreement and will incorporate a dispute resolving procedure confined to that specific problem. Short of even that agreement, the treaty making may simply ignore an application procedure and confine itself to standard setting. This is not to minimize these efforts. At that moment in time, they may be significant, even Nobel Prize worthy achievements. In the aggregate, this piecemeal approach to treaty making produces treaties with dispute resolving mechanisms that are only competent for that part of the general problem the treaty engages. So it's sometimes necessary in order to fashion a meaningful remedy to invoke in a particular case several different treaties, each with its own provision for the application of its substantive rights. Take environmental problems. An environmental problem does not always fit neatly within the boundaries of a single treaty. As a consequence, the international lawyer charged with finding a remedy is often compelled to try to reshape a bespoke integrated strategy straddling a number of different treaties and their respective dispute resolution arrangements. To carry this off, the practitioner must either press one of the relevant tribunals to expand its radiona materiae jurisdiction on the basis of a theory of ancillary jurisdiction, or she must initiate proceedings in several, several forms simultaneously. Both tactics incur systemic costs. An expansive theory of ancillary jurisdiction introduces uncertainty about just what is being committed in treaties, which were accepted on the expectation that they were confined to one part of a problem even short of that, were only standard setting exercises for which the state's parties were unprepared or unwilling to submit to judicially supervised implementation. Overall, an expansive theory of ancillary jurisdiction may solve the lawyer's problem in a specific case, but it will reduce over time the future willingness of states to accept, to accept a jurisdiction which they thought was confined to one treaty. 
the knock-on effects for the international judicial function and for the general willingness to participate in the creation of soft law, a very valuable creation, are systemically costly. By contrast, these problems do not arise in national courts of general jurisdiction. Unlike their international counterparts, they provide one-stop forums for the application of the law which has been prescribed by one-stop legislatures. If we shift our attention to the large offshore areas in which international law simply expresses normative preferences without providing mechanisms for their implementation, the area which Grotius, as I quoted, consigned decision to the conscience of the state, will encounter another reason for a broader focus for the systemic toleration of multiple simultaneous proceedings. Law, to be meaningful, must be authoritative and controlling. A puzzling feature of international law is that some of the most important norms for all their authority are not reliably controlling. To the extent that they become effective, it's due to ad hoc arrangements, coalitions of the willing, informal alliances of governmental and non-governmental actors operating simultaneously in different arenas with a common goal. The effectiveness of these arrangements depend on the end on their operation in multiple proceedings. To illustrate these points, I'd like to turn to two cases. One, the Southern Bluefin Tuna and the other, the Ireland-UK Mox plant. In his general course at the Hague Academy, which he revised and issued under the perennial app title of The Perplexities of Modern International Law, Shabta Rosen illustrated the challenges presented by the multiplicity of treaties and international fora by examining the Southern Bluefin tuna cases. Shabta had served as counsel for Japan in those cases. In that dispute, Shabta wrote, each party invoked a different treaty, each of which has its own dispute settlement provisions, not mutually compatible. End quote. He went on to summarize what transpired, and with your permission, I will quote Shabtai. The applicants instituted arbitration procedures under Annex 7 of the Law of the Sea Convention, alleging breaches of the convention, and immediately also requested ITLOS to prescribe provisional measures. In the Southern Bluefin Tuna provisional measures cases, ITLOS rejected a challenge to its jurisdiction to prescribe compulsory provisional measures under its residual jurisdiction on the basis of its interpretation of the statute. That wasn't decisive since ITLOS only needed to establish that the arbitral tribunal to be constituted might prima facie have jurisdiction over the merits for it to be in a position to prescribe provisional measures. The arbitral tribunal, after full and written oral argument, held that it was without jurisdiction to rule on the merits of the case. Following the practice of the ICJ, that tribunal defined for itself the dispute that was before it and determined which of the two incompatible treaties was applicable. The tribunal held that it would be artificial to find that there were two distinct disputes and accordingly went on to determine for itself which was the governing convention in the circumstances of the case. Thus Shabtai's account of Southern Bluefin Tuna. I think the Mox plant cases proved to be even more complex. In 1947, the UK opened the Sellafield nuclear site on the western coast of England, directly across the Irish Sea from the Republic of Ireland. The site included two nuclear reactors, 
and a reprocessing plant to produce plutonium fuel for atomic bombs. The UK, through the state-owned company British Nuclear Fuels Limited, BNFL, <coughs> continued to expand Sellafield's facilities over the next several decades, at which point it opened a new reprocessing plant on the site known as Thorpe, designed to ingest spent oxide fuel, a type of nuclear waste until then being discarded by the UK and other countries, and to reprocess up to 97% of it into reusable nuclear fuel. In 1996, BNFL completed construction of another on-site facility, the MOX plant, which was designed to transform Thorpe's output into a type of nuclear fuel not used by the UK, mixed oxide fuel, or MOX. According to the business plan, the MOX would be sold and transported by sea for use by other countries. On environmental grounds, Ireland, 100 miles away, opposed the MOX plant throughout its construction and appealed unsuccessfully multiple times to the United Kingdom Environment Agency, UKEA, in an effort to have the project shut down. Finally, shortly before the plant was to be commissioned, Ireland filed the first of what would become four parallel international judicial and arbitral proceedings. In these proceedings, Ireland maintained that from time to time, from the time of its construction in the 1950s, the cell of the site had continually emitted nuclear radiation into the surrounding environment. And as a result, the Irish Sea had become, quoting Ireland's pleadings, among the most radioactively polluted seas in the world. In 2001, while the UKEA was still considering whether to shut down or commission the MOX plant to operate, Ireland initiated arbitral proceedings against the UK at the Permanent Court of Arbitration under the OSPAR Convention. Four months later, just after the UKEA approved the MOX plant, Ireland initiated another proceeding, this time under UNCLOS, before an ad hoc tribunal of the PCA. Two weeks later, Ireland initiated a third proceeding, this time in ITHLOS. This was part of the UNCLOS Chapter 7 arbitration but it was before the tribunal had been constituted and was for the purpose of requesting provisional measures to suspend the MOX plant's imminent opening to avert what Ireland claimed would be irreversible environmental injury. And finally, on October 15, 2003, Ireland, for all its efforts, became a respondent when the European Commission initiated a case against it at the European Court of Justice, charging that in bringing claims against the UK under UNCLOS, Ireland had encroached on the ECJ's exclusive jurisdiction. If those accepted the UK's commitment that it would not transport radioactive materials and did not require the provisional measures requested by Ireland, Ireland's second proceeding had been brought before the, um, an ad hoc tribunal under the Convention for the Protection of the Marine Environment of the Northeast Atlantic, popularly known as the OSPAR, the Oslo Paris Convention. But the OSPAR tribunal concluded that Ireland had no colorable claim under the convention and dismissed the case. In 2001, the European Commission, in view of the then pending OSPAR and UNCLOS proceedings, filed its case before the ECJ. And the ECJ held in 2006 
that by filing under UNCLOS matters that fell under European community law, including claims arising under the EC Treaty and Euratom Treaty, Ireland had intruded on the ECJ's exclusive jurisdiction. The decision of the European Court of Justice coincided with the hearings in the ad hoc committee ad hoc arbitration case and when the ECJ found Ireland in violation of European community law, Ireland withdrew its unclosed Annex 7 dispute. These two cases I submit, especially the Mox plant, illustrate one of the reasons why we encounter parallel procedures in contemporary international law. The lawyers search for a competent forum and an adequate remedy for which there is no single treaty and no single jurisdictional arrangement. Although we international lawyers study them with devotion, judicial and arbitral decisions are exceptional in the international legal process. The great majority of decisions are shaped in international law's political institutions and by bilateral and unilateral action. Multiple parallel procedures occur at the highest level of these political institutions. I'd like to look at Articles 10 to 12 of the United Nations Charter, which approach parallel proceedings or overlapping jurisdictions. Article 11, Paragraph 2, in relevant part, that is Article 11, Paragraph 2 of the Charter, states, and I'll be jumping here. The General Assembly may discuss any questions relating to the maintenance of international peace and security brought before it by any member of the United Nations or by the Security Council, except as provided in Article 12. It may make recommendations with regard to any such questions Article 12, the exception, states, while the Security Council is exercising in respect of any dispute or situation, the functions assigned to it in the present charter, <clears throat> the General Assembly shall not make any recommendation with regard to that dispute or situation unless the Security Council so requests. So according to the text, when the Security Council is seized of a dispute or a situation, the drafters of the Charter did not want the organization to be speaking in multiple voices. Then only the Council was to speak, or so it would have seemed. The International Court's application of these Charter provisions have found ways and contingencies in which the Assemblies and the Court's own role could be expanded parallel to the Council's primary responsibility execution. In the Certain Expenses opinion, the Court effectively ratified the General Assembly's Uniting for Peace resolution, expanding the role of the General Assembly in case of the parallel paralysis of the Security Council. In the Wall opinion, the Court held that, quote, a request for an advisory opinion is not in itself a recommendation by the General Assembly with regard to a dispute or situation. On the basis of this fine distinction, the Court continued, while Article 12 may limit the scope of the action which the Assembly may take subsequent to its receipt of the Court's opinion, it does not in itself limit the authorization to request an advisory opinion. At the same time, the court expanded its own role by distinguishing the legal question from the political aspects of a question, allowing itself at its discretion to open yet another parallel procedure. Thus, in the Wall opinion, 
the court issued clear dispositives to a non-consenting state with respect to a situation of which the Security Council was seized. The implication of the court's jurisprudence on this matter seems to be one in which the application of Charter Article 12, Paragraph 1, the, the instruction of that provision on procedures being pursued, pursued in parallel by two or three principal UN organs is one of case-by-case -case discretion, arguably as a function of the perceived gravity and urgency of the matter at bar. The court explicitly ratified these innovations in its Kosovo opinion when it noted with seeming equanimity that there has been an increasing tendency over time for the General Assembly and the Security Council to deal in parallel with the same matter concerning the maintenance of international peace and security. It is often the case that while the Security Council has tended to focus on the aspects of such matters related to peace and security, the General Assembly has taken a broader view, considering also the humanitarian, social, and economic aspects. In this instance, the elevation of the Assembly to a potential parallel proceeding in security matters was one more step in the demand of the Assembly from the earliest days of the organization for a more meaningful role than the one assigned by the Charter. With all due respect, to suggest that the Assembly has been confining itself in these initiatives solely to humanitarian, social, and economic aspects is a small part of the story. Parallel proceedings here become a technique of power sharing and the enhancement of power of smaller states in the international political arena. I'd like to shift attention to human rights. The human rights treaties manifest the piecemeal approach to international lawmaking to which I referred. The operative code of internationally protected human rights is expressed in a variety of conventions, each with its own substantive focus and its own application mechanism. Thus, specific human rights are expressed in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention Against Torture. I need not read them all. I think you get the idea. Amidst this Lego-like thicket of cognate treaties, a recurring challenge for practitioners of international human rights law, who are, I believe, the best among us, is finding a willing and effective forum. Consider the following scenario. <clears throat> In State X, in our hemisphere, an ethnic minority is being subjected to ethnic cleansing by the armed forces of the government. Destruction of villages, widespread murder and rape, the all too familiar crimes that accompany ethnic cleansing are reported. Human rights NGOs, the principal engines for the invocation and application of human rights law, are desperately seeking to arrest the violence they face the recurring problem of human rights agents, finding an effective and receptive body to apply the law and if the remedies are to be meaningful to do it quickly. Council invoke, among others, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the Human Rights Council, the Council of Europe. They arrange to have a cooperating state try to prorogue ICJ jurisdiction they lobby Congress to condemn the actions and to suspend foreign aid. They initiate actions in U.S. courts under the ever-shrinking alien tort statute. They recruit a celebrity and saturate the airwaves with advertisements, and so on and so on. From the human rights advocate's perspective, initiating these multiple parallel processes is a rational tactic and an ethical imperative. 
as the prospects of even limited success in any one of them are low. Yet failure in one venue is unlikely to affect the reception in the other possible parallel proceedings. Nor is systemic confusion caused by conflicting decisions likely to ensue in as much as the remedy in each venue or arena is substantially the same and the effect of the rejection on jurisdictional grounds in one is confined to that body. In my own experience, when the human rights lawyer in this type of problem turns to the international human rights bodies, the personnel of human rights bodies are sympathetic to the practitioner's efforts and understand the tactical imperatives. There are, however, limitations to institutional tolerance for the specific tactic of pursuing multiple and simultaneous procedures in other human rights bodies. I can't review them all, but I will try to summarize the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, its first op optional protocol, as well as Rule 99. Article 5.2 of the first optional protocol of the International Covenant enjoins the Human Rights Committee from considering individual communications unless cumulatively the same matter is not being examined under another procedure of an international investigation or settlement. As I read the committee's practice, it tends to be more liberal with regard to the same matter. It's defined the same matter as the same claim concerning the same individual submitted by him or someone else who has standing to act on his behalf before other international bodies. In Alzheimer, the committee determined that the same claim has to involve both the same facts and the same substantive rights. And by focusing on the specific substantive rights, it was able to take up a case that had already been before the European Court of Human Rights. There's been a similar flexibility with respect to the, quote, same matter. To qualify as the same matter, the claims must be brought by the same individuals or their representatives. Yet the committee considered claims of the same matter examined by another procedure when the matter was brought by an unrelated party. From the practice that I reviewed, I believe that two scholars concluded correctly that in the committee only individual complaint proceedings before other units United Nations human rights treaty bodies, like the Committee Against Torture, or individual proceedings before regional human rights bodies, namely the bodies under the European and American Conventions on Human Rights, will constitute procedures of the same international investigation or settlement. This brief overview of a representative human rights body indicates that its openness to allow for some multiple parallel procedures, in spite of the formal legal restraints in place in its rules, based on a number of factors, includes, I speculate, the gravity and urgency of the violations, their susceptibility to remediation, and the degree of obligation on the part of the respondent state. There may yet be another factor. The ultimate actor in all law is the individual. And we would be remiss if we did not take into account the impulse of peoples in decision-making roles in a constantly evolving international decision process to enhance the jurisdiction with which they've been momentarily endowed. And they do it in order to render justice in cases in which they believe it calls out for it. This sense of responsibility of a court, tribunal, or committee leads it to try incrementally to extend its jurisdiction in circumstances in which a marginal addition will likely be accepted 
and even applauded in some quarters. There may yet be another less attractive factor, the assertion of these bodies of the exclusive competence to interpret their respective conventions and not to yield to another human rights body in interpreting a similar or, ide or identical right in its own convention. You've been very patient. I have several other examples, but I'd like to just speak very briefly about parallel procedures in international investment law. I'm purposely working through a spectrum of a variety of different, very different endeavors in international law because I believe that in the 21st century, international law has got to be considered as including all of these and not simply the classic subjects of public international law. The distinctive structure of international investment law makes it especially susceptible to the multiplication of parallel procedures for a single dispute. Here we're speaking of proceedings that have proven in themselves to a remarkable degree to be remedially effective thanks to the availability of a large network of national courts for enforcement of their awards. I refer to the New York Convention. Their susceptibility to the multiplication of proceedings derives from the interplay between practices of modern global capitalism, corporate law, and principles of contemporary international law. Together, these features endow each corporation with the legal attributes of separate legal personality and nationality. For financial, business planning, and legal reasons, the vehicles for making direct foreign investment are corporations, which are often composed of many other legal entities in intricate, inter, intricate horizontal and vertical relationships. Because each component corporation has its own nationality, the overall structure of an investor claimant may include, like a matryoshka doll, a variety of legal entities of different nationalities which can converge in a particular investment. Add to this the shareholders who in investment law have standing with their own respective nationalities and the number of potential nationalities converging in a particular investment may expand. The many bilateral and multilateral investment treaties and investment law chapters in trade promotion agreements differ in various ways, but virtually all afford the qualifying investor substantially the same protections and endow a qualifying investor with the right to initiate arbitration against the state party, which is hosting the investment and, of course, has consented a priori to arbitration. If the host state <clears throat> has concluded bids with a number of the states of which the investors' components are nationals, which is not unusual. This ensemble of features can allow for situations in which an investor will have the option of having one or more of its corporate components and some of their shareholders initiating for the same investment dispute simultaneous arbitrations under different bids or contracts containing international commercial arbitration clauses. Thus, for all intents and purposes, the same investment dispute will be proceeding in several parallel proceedings. There are both offensive and defensive reasons for a claimant to try to multiply its bid arbitration into several parallel proceedings. Defensively, the claimant increases its chances of surviving objections to jurisdiction on which many arbitral investment disputes founder. Offensively, the multiplication of parallel procedures enhances the claimant's chances of ultimately securing at least one successful outcome. Now, in theory, the parties to this type of investment dispute can agree to consolidate the multiple procedures. In practice, this is easier said than done, for it will generally oblige the respondent state 
to surrender its potential objections to jurisdiction in return for the claimant yielding its favorable odds for its successful outcome. It may, as a result, prove difficult to reach agreement on consolidation and parallel arbitrations will proceed. Aside from the du duplication of costs involved, the most malign outcome of the such procedural procedures, parallel procedures, would be the inconsistency of the legal and factual holdings of the different arbitrations. And this has happened. Some international investment treaties allow for compulsory consolidation of cases and some try to render a procedure inadmissible if the claimant does not waive the possibility of pursuing parallel options. For example, Article 1121 of NAFTA, the corresponding article is 14D.5 of USMCIA. I refer you to see how strictly this is interpreted to Detroit International Bridge where there's a very narrow interpretation indicating the low tolerance when possible of investment tribunals for competing tribunals. By contrast to the comparative unanimity of domestic law's response to multiple parallel proceedings, no single response for dealing with multiple parallel proceedings emerges in the different islands and offshore zones of international law surveyed here. It should be no surprise. As I noted earlier, the structure of international law and the decision institutions of its constitutive process differ from their municipal counterparts to the point that attempts to find similarities and to build upon them hold little promise. International law aspires on a grand scale, but international ex scripta evolves in a piecemeal fashion. Its jurisdictional creations are not coordinated. There is only one court of general jurisdiction, and its jurisdiction depends on the consent of both litigants and its power to compel compliance with its decisions is at best thin. The ambivalence of international law manifested in the responses to the phenomenon of multiple parallel proceedings derives from the complementarity and tension in all law between the demand that there be an end to the litigation of an issue on the one hand, on the other, the demand that justice be done, no matter how long and how many times, are required. In closing, let me hazard a number of recommendations to you with respect to the wide recurrence of multiple parallel procedures. Where possible, when it is possible, there should be consolidation of parallel procedures if an appropriate remedy can be achieved. Parallel procedures to secure an urgent remedy for ongoing human rights violations should be tolerated in direct proportion to the reality and gravity of the human rights violations underway and the prospective adequacy of the remedy sought. Parallel procedures to enforce a race judicata international judgment or award in multiple fora should be permitted. Parallel procedures that are manifestly abusive should be rejected. Finally, with respect to the even more complex question of multiple parallel procedures between international and national decision processes, I'd like to conclude by quoting Shabtai Rosen who recommended judicial courtesy. And let me read a selection from his perplexities of modern international law. He wrote, with respect to judicial courtesy, 
<clears throat> a tribunal properly seized of a case that is already before another tribunal, whether an international tribunal or a national tribunal of another jurisdiction, ought to refrain from reaching a final decision on the matter, which that other court has to decide until that other court has reached its decision. With this plea for judicial courtesy, which I would extend to the courtesy of all international decision makers, I conclude this lecture with these words of Shakhtar Razan. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank Professor Riesman for his learned and thought-provoking lecture this evening. As you formulate your questions, I'd like to take a moment just to say how good it is to have you here, Michael, uh, with us, uh, not only as our honorary president and Hudson Medal recipient, but as a teacher and mentor to so many of us. Uh, I'm one of the innumerable Riesman students whose thinking was profoundly shaped by your wisdom and intellect. Indeed, I, I came to the society after leaving government service in large part due to your continuing influence and example. I know I speak for all of your friends and colleagues here in saying how much we cherish your devotion to this institution and your continued engagement with our mission. And now we will turn to your questions. Uh, when you're recognized, please wait for the microphone, speak into it clearly, tell us your name, and if you wish, your affiliation. And finally, please keep your questions brief and be sure they end with a question mark. <laughs> so who would like to have the honor of the first question? I see a hand from our president. So I'm still Sean Murphy, president of ASIL. Uh, Michael, thank you for a wonderful uh, talk. It uh, covered a lot of ground. Uh, my question is, um, when we look at a compromissory clause in a treaty that provides jurisdiction to a court or a tribunal, and I'll use the International Court of Justice, but it could be any tribunal, the, the classic compromissory clause would uh, say you two parties should try to negotiate. If you can't resolve by negotiation, arbitrate, and only ultimately uh, might you end up before us. And, and to me, that's a, an effort to say if there's some other way of resolving this, uh, explore that first. Classically, that, that would have just meant the two parties themselves working something out. But I'm wondering if we now have all these other islands out there of places parties can have disputes addressed. Um, should a tribunal or a court um, be more receptive to the invocation of those other places as a means of barring its own jurisdiction? or? does it not really change the way a classic analysis should go forward under a compromissory clause? It's a very provocative question, Sean. I'd say first that since we're talking about the International Court or the Permanent Court before it, that court had on occasion suspended its proceedings in order to encourage negotiation. I think of the Savoy and Jex case in that regard. The willingness of a court or tribunal to have a settlement also depends on the extent to which the legal issue that's involved concerns only those two parties or raises a larger issue which should be adjudicated by third parties. Whether in the future tribunals or courts will 
avail themselves of mediation opportunities and conciliation procedures, some of which have had some brilliant successes in the recent past. That depends on your degree of optimism about the rationality of decision makers. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Yeah, great. Yes, thank you so much. I'm, I'm Bjorn Arp from American University. Um, I would appreciate if you can, could elaborate a little bit more on, on your argument that different tribunals should react differently on this phenomenon of parallel proceedings so that tribunals that do not have or are not as efficient as far as I have understood you, uh, they should be more open to parallel proceedings and those that uh, have an adjudicative process that is very clear and that, that are also followed um, should, um, should be less open to parallel proceedings. Uh, wouldn't this, I mean, who, who would decide on, 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 on the alleged efficiency of tribunals and wouldn't it pose, on the other hand, certain threats to the international judicial uh, or international dispute resolution processes? Uh, because you're essentially lining out a sort of hierarchy, no? I, as I see it, of different tribunals, uh, tri tribunals that are more efficient or better even than, than others. So, so I, I would, I would like to have more insights from you on that. If we look at things domestically, <clears throat> we are all comfortable with the principle of least pendants and forum convenience and forum non-convenience because we know that it's being applied as between parallel courts, each of which is fair and shares the same values and whose procedures can be expected to be proper. In international law, we don't often have that luxury of a lot of good decision making. So I think that in some circumstances, a tribunal which doesn't have the power to issue an anti-suit injunction in international law, I would think might hold on to a case even if it's in a parallel institution has seized it as a way of ensuring that a decent outcome emerges. I think I would emphasize that Alan referred to the New Haven School. I've been very careful not to try to proselytize on this <laughs> evening. But I would emphasize that the school believes that decision makers bear a major responsibility, not simply to fidelity to the law in a black letter sense, but fidelity to the larger optimum policy goals, justice, and should not shirk a, a circumstances in which a decision that contributes to that has to be taken. Any further questions? Yes, this one right there. Hi, uh, David Biggie from the Department of State. Uh, Professor Reisman, thank you for the lecture. It was very interesting. The, um, you, you opened the lecture um, by pointing to fragmentation, and I think the structure of your lecture certainly exemplified the fragmentation going through the different uh, subject matters that you addressed. Uh, my question was about fragmentation specifically in the area of parallel proceedings. To what extent can 
and sh or should the practitioners and tribunals in the different subject areas in human rights, in environment, in investment, or, or in commercial arbitration, um, to what extent can or should they be looking to the other subject areas to determine how to handle parallel proceedings? Well, thank you for the question. I think that anyone who is in a decision situation looks for whatever information is available and passes up no experience that might be relevant to when making an informed decision. So certainly one looks to others. But I'd like to correct what may be a misimpression, and that is when I speak about fragmentation, I'm not speaking about it in the sense in which the ILC or Professor Koskinyemi did it. I'm speaking about it in the sense of we have broad programs that there's a major consensus on among large numbers of states to make law that can be effectively applied. A relatively small number of states will be able to sign on immediately. And so you will have a convention on information about environmental actions that will have environmental consequences and then another convention on a different aspect of environmental law, and then another, and these will be staggered over a period of time. So when you have a problem, for example, the problem that Ireland encountered or believed it encountered, Ireland had no choice but to try to put together a lot of different treaties. That's a different sense of fragmentation. And I that's what I was referring to. I hope that that's helpful. We have time for one more question. Gentleman here. I, I should say oh. one, a bit of a mea culpa. Uh, the Ospar case that I referred to, I was the chair of that case. So I'm not sure that I, I don't want to be seen to be defending it. I, it was a very hard case in a majority decision. Sorry. Thank you. Hi, Michael Pay. Uh, I've had the uh, great pleasure of appearing before Michael when he was on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I was representing the United States government. Uh, wonderful lecture tonight, uh, uh, Professor Reisman. Uh, my question is, to what extent does this uh, multiplicity in parallel proceedings um, is it undercutting the principle that uh, judicial bodies um, should avoid, uh, to the extent possible, being drawn into making or rendering advisory opinions as opposed to um, uh, uh, this decisions that are definitive and final with, that can have res judicata effect in a real case or controversy? that only they are deciding. In a nearly perfect world, that would be great. In a very imperfect world, I think you must use every opportunity possible to introduce a legal perspective, a perspective on what the law requires. And if it has to be through the vehicle of an advisory opinion, I acknowledge that it's not the same as a binding decision but it's better than nothing. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we probably could have gone on, but um, I'd like to close uh, by thanking the um, Rosen family, and particularly our special guests, Danny and Sippy Rosen, uh, Peter Kuberg, and Marie Sheldon of Brill Nyhoff, and Alan Stevens, who originated these lectures and helps perpetuate them. 
I also would like to thank our distinguished member and patron, Manush Arsanjani, who also happens to be Michael's spouse, as you have heard, and as always, the superb staff of the society here at Tiller House. I invite you to greet all of our guests at the reception in the next room, and now please join me in thanking Professor Michael Reisman.